Okay, well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to the famous and historic Dan Buster's Inn in Scampton, um, Lincolnshire, East Midlands. Uh, today, unfortunately, the inn is closed because of COVID. However, um, they still have their takeout menu. And today on the menu is battered Grimsby haddock with a side of chips and mushy peas, all for the very affordable price of nine pounds. However, um, I have to tell you, I'm really, really not here in the East Midlands. I'm on Sanibel Island at the Sanibel Public Library. And um, this is uh, the beginning of our uh, program of World War II uh, programs. Unfortunately, we're not doing any in-person pro in programs going to focus on three, four um, very important operations from the year 1943. Uh, but there is a couple program notes that I want to go over with you first. And uh, that is, um, unfortunately, this summer, we lost one of our dear friends and benefactors of the library, Mr. Ed Sieber. Those of you who follow this program know that last year, Mr. Sieber gave a very um, interesting and informative program on his role in the sinking of the giant Japanese battleship Yamato, and he will be um, sorely missed. A couple of shout outs today. Uh, if uh, Mr. Gollan is watching in Upper Scotland, hello, Richard. Uh, it's about three o'clock there, probably, and just about time for you to brew up some tea. Now, those of you who are watching, um, you do have about maybe 30 seconds or 60 seconds to go grab a cup of something hot or a little something to munch on while I'm regaling you about this uh, operation. Um, several of the program notes on February 12th, which is going to be our next program, we will be doing Operation Vengeance, which is the assassination of Admiral Isuroko Yamamoto in 1943. February 24, we will be doing Operation Tidal Wave, which was the bombing of the Romanian oil fields in uh, also in 1943 in Ploeste. And we will finish up in March 17 with um, the uh, Operation Ica, which is the rescue operation that was mounted to save um, Benito Mussolini and bring him back to uh, Hitler where they could uh, get back together again. And uh, that is the um, extent of our programs that we will have. However, we are online as you can see, but that's not gonna let you off the hook for a couple of things that uh, we usually do in our in-person programs, somewhere in this program is embedded a pop quiz. Now, how we're gonna do things differently is that when that pop quiz pops up, if you know the answer, you're gonna have just a very short time to email me your answer. And the first three correct answers will get a free book, right? Um, the answer will be given at the end of the program. Now, um, for those of you who do stick with us for the entire program, there will be an exciting and fun video right at the end. So one more shout out um, up to Pennsylvania, where hopefully my son and daughter are listening today. Um, I love you both, and we're going to commence. Danny, let's start. Okay, today, Operation Chastise, which is probably uh, the most brilliant operation, um, the, maybe the entire war. You probably heard a lot about it. Um, and we'll start off with the English dictionary uh, definition of the word chastise. It is to punish or to hurt. Now, um, even before the Second World War, all nations have their war plans and Great Britain was no different. They anticipated having a war with Germany at some time and they needed to identify their weak points. 
And it was discovered that the Ruhr Valley, the heavy industrialized area of Germany, there were a number of dams. And those dams, if they could be breached, would cause a severe um, crimp in Germany's ability. Uh, the water was used uh, in the industrial area for steel, uh, not only drinking water, but also uh, the canal and transportation system. So um, how to do this? Well, uh, at the time, Great Britain did not have an adequate bomber to deliver a bomb that could breach these massive, huge dams on the Ruhr River. So they set about trying to figure out how to do that. And the person that started actually working on this problem independently was Barnes Wallace. Barnes Wallace first uh, introduced the idea of dropping a giant, what he called an earthquake bomb, a 22,000 pound bomb from 40,000 feet. Well, unfortunately, uh, Great Britain did not possess a bomber uh, of, of that type at the time. And also bomber command was used to area bombing. They were not practiced in uh, tactical or pinpoint bombing, uh, which is something that would definitely be needed. Also an impediment was around these largest dams. They had torpedo nets, which the Germans anticipated a possible torpedo attack. So they had the torpedo nets there. What to do? So Barnes Wallace started working on this problem. Um, his history, he worked on the Wellington. In fact, he designed it. But unfortunately, it is only a two engine bomber and not capable of carrying uh, a very large load. So he, uh, these, these bombers that he designed and they built were uh, very tough because they were of a geodesic design. Um, and this came directly from his uh, design and uh, involvement with uh, airships, which is, if you see, this looks a lot like an airship uh, on the left-hand side of your screen. And as you can see uh, on the right side, because of that design, they were able to take a lot of um, punishment and still return. So. Barnes Wallace, what does he do? What's he come up with? He wants to come up with a bomb that can be delivered to the dam, go up against the dam and cause a breach. Still a problem. So what to do? He worked on several different designs and this is what he came up with. He came up with what was called upkeep. And upkeep is a 9,000 pound bomb in the shape of a very large depth charge. And it was designed, he put all this together, he tested things in his backyard, he tried, he went to uh, the Ministry of uh, Aircraft Production to sell them on the idea of this bomb, how it would work, it would skip across the water and jump over the torpedo nets and go up against the dam, sink beside the dam wall and explode. Where did he get this idea? Well. Britain being a great naval power, he got this idea from seeing how cannonballs would skip across the water uh, during the age of sail. So the bigger problem, again, how were they going to deliver this mine, this bomb that is known as upkeep? The uh, brilliant aircraft designer, Roy Chadwick came up with a variant of the Lancaster. And if you notice, there's a couple of very important um, design changes that was done on this particular uh, aircraft. You notice that the top turret has been removed. That was to um, get rid of drag. Unfortunately, even to begin with, the Lancaster was not really well armed. It had a lot of flaws. There were the escape hatches were not very good. So the survival rate for bomber command uh, crew was not uh, really great. However, the really important thing that you see is the underside, the ventral part of this aircraft. There's a, a concave section there and that is where the upkeep would be stored on the way uh, to the target. 
How to do that? They had to remove the bomb bay doors, uh, and uh, that was going to be uh, important. They also up uh, charged the engines. Uh, they used uh, American built Packard Merlin engines. Now, you're all wondering, okay, how are they actually going to do this? Well, this is how the upkeep is going to work. Danny. Next slide is not coming up. Okay. Um, how's the upkeep going to work? Well, I already told you how they were going to deliver it. It is underneath the ventral portion of the aircraft. It's supported by two uh, V-shaped crutch type calipers. And the bomb was going to spin in a counterclockwise motion at 500 RPMs. If you see the middle of the screen there, the upkeep, that is the development that he went through. He went through several different permutations before they came up with the final design of upkeep. Uh, all of the testing up to that point had not worked, so they finally came upon this design, as I say, in the shape of a large uh, depth charge. And as you see on the bottom part of your screen, how the, uh, the upkeep was going to be spinning in backwards, it was on a pulley system. And the, the pilots found out that this created quite a bit of vibration uh, throughout the aircraft. There's also the hydrostatic pistols in there, also a self-destruct pistol. Uh, so in case they lost one of these, they did not want the Germans to be able to uh, discover how it worked. Here's a better look here at the hydraulic motor of how it worked, uh, spinning uh, the bomb uh, counterclockwise again at 500 uh, RPMs. Now we're going to go back to this right here. Okay. I wanted to explain to you several of the problems that were going to be encountered. First of all, they had to go in the first or second week of May. That is when the water in these reservoirs and the dam would be at their height. They wanted to explode, breach these dams when they would cause the greatest amount of damage if they were able to breach them. Also, they had to go during a full moon, so they would have enough light. The kicker is they had to come in at about 60 feet, flying at night at 60 feet. They had to discover also how would they know when they were at that right height because the altimeter would not work that low. So they came up with two what they call Aldous lights, one in the rear part of the aircraft, one in the forward. And as the plane went down, 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 whenever those two lights would come together, they would know they were at the right height. Well, that solved that problem. But how would they know when to release the bomb? At what distance? Again, uh, ingenuity stepped in and um, an engineer by the name of Dan, D-A-N-N, -N, came up with a sort of a V type device that they held in front. The bomb aimer would hold, as you can see it, like right in front of my head. And the two prongs, when they came together at the two turrets of the dam, that's when they knew when to release the bomb. And again, we looked at that. Now, uh, they started doing the testing. And uh, in Max Hastings' book, uh, Operation Chastise, which is available at the library, uh, probably the best work done on this, he goes into great detail about trials and tribulations that Barnes Wallace had to go through to uh, put forward this idea. There, he met a lot of re resistance, but he also had a lot of support, too. At first, his ideas sounded really wacky, and then they started doing the tests down at Reekhalber and other places. And this is uh, Wallace and some of his uh, associates looking at uh, the testing. The testing didn't always go well. Of course, these were dummy bombs, dummy bombs filled with cement. And an interesting um, story that uh, this is a, a sideline. In 2018, a father and his uh, son were um, walking along the beach, and I guess the tide had settled uh, to a certain point, and they saw this huge round uh, chunk of cement, 
that was actually the interior of one of these practice bombs and they had found it. Well, okay, they're busy solving the problem of the, uh, the weapon. Uh, now they had to find the men to take care of this and to deliver it. They decided on this gentleman, Wing Commander Guy um, Gibson, and something you guys need to remember, guys, ladies, Damen, Herren, you need to remember, all of these guys, the pilots, the bomb aimers, the gunners, all of these guys, the majority of them were not beyond the age of 25. And they were being called upon to do one of the most titanic and courageous acts in the entire Second World War. Guy Gibson, uh, he was going to be the wing commander. He would pick, hand pick the crews, hand pick the pilots, and they would uh, come together in what would be known as the 617 squadron. Um, for his uh, efforts in this raid, he would be uh, awarded the Victoria Cross. Now, again, think about their age. Some of the pilots, one of them was only 20 years old but they had already had 25 or more combat missions flying over Germany. Now remember Bomber Command in Britain, most of their uh, missions were at night and uh, they suffered uh, quite horribly. And here's a picture of Guy Gibson and his crew. The sad thing is that nobody in this picture is gonna survive the war, they would all be killed at some point after this raid. Now here's a look at the inside in the pilot section uh, of the Lancaster. Uh, you see the pilot on the left and the flight engineer on the right. The majority of Lancaster crews uh, were usually seven. You had a, a front gunner, a rear gunner, and uh, these guys. And um, here's a good picture of the mine uh, underneath. And everything was going well, the training, um, the crews had come together in Scampton, in the place where I'm not really, um, the Scampton uh, airfield, and they practiced there. They went down to the coast and practiced again with the, uh, the dummy bombs. And uh, May was coming and it was time for them to prepare for the mission. Now, how was this going to be done? This is actually a pretty bad slide right here, but and it's a little confusing. Uh, they were going to leave Scampton, as you can see in the upper left-hand side of your screen. They were going to leave Scampton in three waves. The first wave was going to have nine Lancasters, uh, all with upkeeps, um, and it would be uh, led by Guy Gibson. There were two other waves, a second wave, which would fly directly uh, east and down through the top of the Netherlands and a third wave, which would take off later and they would be directed by radio to any of the targets that would um, still need to be attacked. Now, the dams that they were going to hit, it was the Myrna Dam, the Eider Dam, the Ineppa Dam and the Zorka Dam. These were all uh, in different areas. They had good intelligence on the Mona Dam, not really great intelligence on the other ones. There was one that they knew, the Mona Dam, they knew for sure that that is one that was going to be very heavily defended. Here's a much better map right here uh, that you can see. And this shows you the direction that uh, they went down and they had to fly quite a long distance into uh, Germany. Well. They're going to leave, and this is a, a, a close-up view of uh, those different dams. You can see, you can orient yourself, uh, Cologne, Dusseldorf, uh, Dortmund, and Kassel. And of course, the Eder River, the Eder Dam, the Zorpa, and the Myrna. Now, the mission is about to begin. On May 16th, uh, just about 9 p.m., the first wave took off, 19 planes, um, and an interesting story is that then when 
Uh, Barnes Wallace was sort of like a mother hen just before they took off. He was running around to all the different uh, planes, making sure that the upkeep was in the right position. And during one of the loading um, sequences, the calipers released and the upkeep fell to the ground. Uh, fortunately, it did not explode at that time. And uh, another uh, thing which was kind of a bad omen is that um, Guy Gibson's dog, unfortunately, that evening was run over and killed. So he was not, um, uh, he was not uh, very happy. He was very sad about this. Uh, another thing is that one of the leaders, um, Pilot McCarthy, who actually was an American flying for the Canadian Air Force, he uh, got into his plane and found that there had been a coolant leak, so he was not able to take off. And he ran to one of the other planes, one of the backup planes, and it was, uh, uh, unfortunately, it did not have the two lights installed, uh, and uh, they he had to go with that. However, he was going to be going to the Zorka Dam, and I'll tell you uh, a little bit why that is um, um, different from the other the other dams, the Myrna Dam and, and the uh, Eider. However, here is uh, our graphic, and you can see that um, the approach to the uh, Mona Dam was pretty direct, and uh, there they lined up. Guy Gibson, of course, he went in first, and he he flew down down, 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 down. Everything started coming together and uh, the lights came together. They were the exact position. He, let, he lets go the upkeep. It bounces over the torpedo nets, but is short and falls uh, without breaching the dam. Next in um, is uh, pilot Hopgood. He comes in and unfortunately at the Myrna Dam, there are six 20 millimeter um, cannon emplacements. They were gonna defend this dam. So there was a lot of flak coming up at them, straight at them. Uh, the front gunner in the Lancaster, he's shooting back, trying to knock these guns out. But uh, several of the cannon shells hits Hopgood's plane. Uh, it's on fire. He releases his upkeep. It bounces, hits the top of the dam, goes over and hits that power station right behind and explodes. Uh, he banks over and his plane crashes over the next hill. Next in is uh, pilot Martin. He comes in, same approach as you can see on your screen. He comes in, he misjudges his distance, his upkeep bounces to the side and falls uh, short of the dam. Next is pilot Young. He comes in, he has a perfect hit. It bounces over the torpedo nets, hits the dam wall, sinks and explodes against the dam. And the rear gunner is looking behind him to see what the damage uh, is and he reports. And he can't quite tell because there's so much smoke and so much mist from the explosions, but he thought he saw a crack. He wasn't sure. So he flies off. Next pilot is uh, pilot Mulphy. He comes in. He comes in. He has a perfect approach. He drops his upkeep. It bounces over the torpedo nets, hits the wall, goes down 30 feet, explodes, and bam! The whole dam explodes right in the middle. There's a 250-foot gap that just rips right through the center of that dam. The water immediately starts pouring through. And you have to understand, you take a look at the Monaze, you take a look at the reservoir and the dam, about two, this is gonna be hard, about 200 million tons of water starts pouring through. It sends a tidal wave of 33 feet down the valley. And the last Lancaster pilot, as he flies through, his name was Shannon. He did not have to drop his, but he certainly saw what was happening. He was flying over and he looks down and he sees cars going along the road and he sees the headlights turn from white to yellow to green and then they're gone. And this was because the flood had just 
taken over and started washing down. Here's a good picture of what they were looking at, as you can see. Underneath, those are the two Aldous lights, the two spotlights. It had to be dropped exactly at 60 feet, exactly from 600 yards away. And like a stone, it would pop over. Now, here's the centerpiece, probably. This is probably the best slide you're ever going to see on this. This shows you everything you need to know. Unfortunately, um, three of the aircraft had to return. Pilot Rice, Pilot Monroe. Uh, Pilot Rice was flying too low as he was going over uh, the North Sea. He was flying too low. He hit the water and lost his bomb, and he had to return and go back. Pilot Monroe uh, suffered flak damage to his tail. Uh, before um, even getting to Germany, he had to turn around. He had to go back. Um, five of the planes were lost on the way in to uh, Flak. As you see, those four large uh, explosions in the middle, uh, they were lost to Flak emplacements. One aircraft actually flew over a German um, air base, and it was hit by Flak. He crashed actually on the airfield. And... As you can see, during the attack, uh, there were three pilots that were lost. Eight aircraft were able to successfully return. So let's go back again uh, and talk about uh, the next dam, the, uh, the Zorpa Dam. Well, you can see only two upkeeps were dropped there. Well, why is that? Uh, Pilot McCarthy, the American, and Brown, uh, they were the only ones that eventually made it to the Zorpa Dam because the other three pilots in that wave were lost on the way in. Now, the difference here is that the Zorpa Dam was not a concrete uh, stone dam the way the Myrna Dam and the Ader Dam. It was an earthen dam, but it had a concrete core to it. So what to do on this? So they were going to fly over the length of the dam and they would not spin the upkeep. It would be dropped instead like a bomb. Now, what happened is that the two upkeeps were delivered. They hit, they actually damaged the Zorpa Dam, but they did not uh, breach it. Here's a picture of the American McCarthy and in his plane, T for Tommy, uh, their mine, again, as I said, hit the Zorpa Dam uh, with no effect they were able to actually return uh, from their mission. Here's a very good slide right here. This shows you exactly how it was done. Uh, again, when the downward pointed Aldous lights came together, uh, the pilot knew then they were at the right height. And with the Dan sight like this, lining up the turrets, they were able to know um, the distance. And as you see the Dan skipping, jumps over the torpedo nets, as you can see to the right side of your screen, hits the wall, goes down, and explodes. Here is the other mission uh, to the Ader Dam. Three upkeeps were dropped here. Shannon, who was part of the first wave, uh, who was called off at the Myrna, was able to go and uh, uh, attack the Ader. And several of the um, planes that had already dropped their upkeeps went along to act as a decoy. Now, the difference with the Ader Dam is that there was no defense there. So, and probably for good reason for these guys, because as you can see, the approach to this dam is very, very difficult. It's hard to see on the slide, but if you look at the top hand right, there's a castle on top of a hill, a very high hill. And on the bottom behind the dam, there's another hill a very high hill. And um, Max Hastings was saying what these pilots had to do in delivering this upkeep here was akin to an elephant trying to do, do what a gazelle could do. And the reason why he said that is that the Lancaster fully loaded was 30 tons. Granted, it had four engines and it was very powerful, but they had to fly over this castle go down, 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 dive, make a turn, and then go over a very short space of water and drop their bomb. Well, Shannon uh, delivered his upkeep 
and they didn't really get near the center of the dam. His upkeep hits. The two other pilots that came in, Maudsley, um, it looked like he had had some damage on the way in, but he was still able to successfully uh, drop his upkeep again as they fly over. The rear gunner's looking at this and he sees no damage. However, the last pilot in, um, pilot Knight, he comes in, he sees what he needs to do. Again, they're flying down, 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 down. They have to make a quick turn, drop the upkeep, and his upkeep breached the dam. Now, we're going to take a look at some of the aftermath, and you need to peel your eyes here to this picture. This is the aftermath at the Mona Dam. Now, what do you see that's really odd about this picture? Now, granted, you can't answer me, but if you look very carefully, you see the breach there in the middle. But up to the left-hand side, you see some barrage balloons. This is what they call closing the barn door after the horse is out. Those balloons were not there before the rain, but then they put them up afterwards. Now, here's a picture um, of the Ader Dam. As you can see from the damage, uh, it's a little offset. And how did they get these pictures? Well, after the pilots that survived came back, they dispatched a uh, Spitfire uh, fighter plane to do a photographic mission. And he flew over. And the um, interesting thing is that with the Mona, when he was flying over that, right there. Um, before he even got there, he's flying along and he's looking at sort of a lot of industrial haze and smoke that you would see uh, in an industrialized area. But then he saw these huge kind of green patches that looked like low hanging clouds. But when he got there, he saw that this was the result of all of that water, all those millions of tons of water um, going downstream. And this is what some of the area looked like afterwards. There was a lot of damage, uh, a lot of loss of life. Here's another picture that gives you a really, really good picture. And uh, we'll discuss about the, uh, the aftermath of this. The majority of the casualties in and around the dams, Neheim and some of the other towns there was about 1,500 to 1,900 people killed, drowned. About 600 of those were Germans, but the majority of those were foreign laborers, French laborers, Polish laborers, uh, laborers from Ukraine, who were working in those factories in, and those machine shops. And a lot of them uh, did indeed perish. Now, the interesting thing is when the signal came back from the Lancasters, when they were on their way back, the signal came back that they had successfully breached uh, these dams. Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur Harris, he jumped up and he ran over to Wallace, who by that time was a nervous wreck because several, as you saw, of those upkeeps did not explode. He was very nervous. But then afterwards, when it was determined that they had indeed breached two of the dams, he ran over and says, Wallace, you can sell me a pink elephant. Now, that's funny because up to this time, Sir Arthur Harris was a huge skeptic. He kept putting all kinds of roadblocks in Wallace's path. This is never going to work. It's a wacky idea. And suddenly, he is there at Scampton as the planes are flying back and the planes are landing. He's there to congratulate them. He says, good show, boys. That was really wizard, which is their term for, you know, you really did a good job. So then we're going to continue. Oh, wait a minute. You know what? I've talked to my wife on and off about all of this, and she just keeps getting, doing this to me. I mean, she keeps putting these slides in, and I'm sorry. I, there's, there's nothing I can do about it. Um, so we're going to move on here. All right, some of the other things that Barnes Wallace worked on, he was actually working on these large bombs um, before 
uh, upkeep. Again, he wanted to work on what was known as an earthquake bomb uh, that could be used to breach, uh, hopefully maybe the U-boat pens uh, in the uh, French North Coast uh, that were very thick. Uh, he came up with a tall boy and a grand slam. Now, what's the difference? The tall boy was a 12,000 pound bomb and the grand slam was a 22,000 pound bomb. All right, ready? Take a deep breath, here it comes. Here's your pop quiz. What was the target of a raid on November 12, 1944, where tall boys, the 12,000 pound bombs were used to destroy a target? Now, look very carefully, get your pencil, get your pen, get your paper, and look at my email on the bottom there, okay? The first three correct answers will get a free book. Now, okay, if you're in the UK, all right, I'm gonna have to say, I'm gonna have to wait for you to come back um, and then give you your book then. But if you're anywhere in the area, stop by to the library and you can get your book. I might even mail it to you if, uh, if I feel like it. So anyway, one of the other things that uh, Barnes Wallace uh, had worked on was what was called a high ball. Now this looks like a very large golf ball. Uh, unfortunately, it's a very explosive golf ball. And it was supposed to be used against uh, enemy shipping. Unfortunately, it, uh, it never was. Uh, next slide. Here's more congratulations. Here's King George VI. He speaks to Flight Lieutenant Les Monroe uh, from 617 Squadron. Unfortunately, Monroe, his aircraft was damaged, as I said, um, on the Dutch coast, and he never returned. Here's another congratulatory picture, uh, Air uh, Marshal Cochran, who's actually a big supporter of Guy Gibson and then the raid. And again, King George uh, comes in for a photo op. Uh, and they're all very happy about the results of that. Okay, we're gonna continue here. I'm sorry about the grainy nature of this picture, but it was taken out of a book. This is the Mona Dam after the raid. These are all the scaffolding uh, that was put up. And we're gradually coming down um, to the end of the presentation where we're going to talk about the pros and cons of this raid, whether it was worth the whole effort Here's a picture, again, kind of grainy. This is um, um, Armaments Minister um, Albert Speer. He comes and he is looking at uh, the damage. He will write in his book, Inside the Third Reich, later, about how amazed he was afterwards, the months and months afterwards, how amazed he was. And this is an opinion that was shared by Barnes Wallace why was there no follow-up raid with conventional bombs? When all of their dams looked like this, when they were all the scaffolding and they were working on this, and by the way, all of these dams were repaired by September or October 1943. Why was there no follow-up raid? Well, there was a lot of blame to go around uh, on the German side and on the British side. On the German side, Hitler and Speer and the others were livid about the fact that the Luftwaffe never showed up. Here's 19 British bombers flying deep into Germany, blowing up some dams, a full moon at night. And granted, they were flying at low level, so radar wasn't really that effective. But they were that deep in enemy territory and there was no response by the German Air Force. Hitler was nearly crazy about this. So afterwards, there's various memorials. This is a plaque. And what the Germans called this was the Mona Katastrophe, or the Mona Catastrophe, occurring on the evening of May 16th and the morning of May 17th. This shows the bombs dropping. And here is uh, another memorial at Nieheim, uh, which is about four miles from the Myrna Dam, um, memorializing the hundreds and uh, 1,500 people that lost their lives. This is a memorial uh, in Holland. This is to uh, Pilot Young, who actually was the man who dropped 
one of the successful upkeeps at the Myrna Dam, he and his entire um, crew were lost. When they were flying back over Holland, again, they were flying at very low level. Even going home, they were flying at very low level. And the flak got them, and the you, they were described, the gunners were describing uh, the different flak shells were actually bouncing off the water. They were flying that low. But unfortunately, these guys were lost. And here's uh, another memorial. That's a bigger uh, shot um, of that. Here's a monument to Barnes Wallace in Kent, uh, near one of the sites where the bouncing bomb um, was uh, tested. Here's the memorial to all of the uh, chastised uh, crews in Lincolnshire, very close by to the uh, Dam Busters Inn, which I am not in. Um, what happened to some of the people? Well, Guy Gibson, uh, as I told you in that one slide with his crew, the crew didn't make it. Uh, Guy Gibson died when he was flying an escort a, in a uh, British Mosquito. He was shot down um, over Holland uh, in near a, a town called uh, Steenbergen. And today there's actually a, a plaque, a memorial on that street, which um, my Dutch is not great, but they call it Gibson Street. Uh, uh, and you can see uh, a lot of tourists uh, uh, visit there. So now we're gonna talk about the cost, okay? Which we always do. Um, British planes that were lost, eight. Now, 53 of the crew members were killed, inbound and outbound. Three of the crew members were captured. Now, how did that happen? One of the planes that were hit uh, on the mission at the uh, Eider Dam, two of the uh, crew members were able to parachute out. Uh, the third one that uh, parachuted out uh, was killed. But the interesting thing about the one other crew member that survived, he was in one of those planes that were flying back to Holland that actually crashed. He was thrown clear of uh, the wreckage and he was uh, captured. The number of civilians that were killed, uh, 1,400. Again, many of the factories, machine shops that were destroyed were back and running uh, in a few months. So there was a lot of controversy about whether this mission was actually um, necessary. The net result, again, this came at a time when British morale really needed a boost. And this fantastic, brilliant raid where so many people came together to make it happen was a huge boost for British morale. On the other side, it was a big um, blow to German morale because now they knew that uh, the enemy planes could come deep into the territory and cause serious damage. Here's a very sobering slide right here. Of Bomber Command, 57,000 members of the RAF lost their lives or were reported missing in the entire uh, Second World War. Uh, a statistic that I kind of alluded to before, say the difference between the British Lancaster and our B-17, the B-17 had a larger number of escape hatches that they could get out of, where the Lancaster did not. Uh, the Lancaster was more thin-skinned um, than the B-17. So the, the statistic is roughly half of American uh, air crews that got into trouble or were shot down were able to escape their plane, where one in five crew members in the RAF were able to escape theirs. Now to the left, you see the squadron uh, seal that the 617 squadron adopted. Um, and on the bottom, you see the French phrase, après moi les déluges, which means after me, the flood. And as you see in the middle, the three uh, lightning bolts, that's actually the dam breaking. Um, interesting thing is that the 617 squadron went on to um, deliver some other missions. The 617 squadron is actually still in existence today. 
and they went through a number of different aircraft during the 70s and 80s. They flew Panavium uh, tornadoes. Now they fly the very sophisticated F-35. And they and the um, British Navy sort of come together. And I wasn't able to see the exact position of the aircraft carrier Queen Elizabeth, but in September, they were operating in the English Channel. So the 617 Squadron still lives. Now, um, here's a slide right here. This is Barnes Wallace and Michael Redgrave, who played him in uh, the movie, The Dam Busters. Very uh, close resemblance. Uh, another person who is in that movie, if you have seen that movie, is uh, Richard Todd. Richard Todd was actually a uh, paratrooper in um, the uh, Second World War, War, British paratrooper. He played a paratrooper in the movie, The Longest Day, and he played Guy Gibson in the movie, The Dam Busters. Okay, hopefully now you had enough time to think about our quiz question. And if you have had enough time, I hope you sent in your answer because here's your answer right here. The German battleship Tirpitz was sunk by three hits from three tall boys on November 12th, 1944, delivered by the 617 Squadron. Now, um, we're gonna go to the next slide and Danny tells me there's a very nice little video that's coming that will put all of this together for you. I want you to visit the library. If you're here, I want you to also know that we, just like the Scampton in here, the Dam Busters, we have curbside service. So if you want anything and you don't want to come into the library, just let us know. We'll put it in bags. We'll put it outside down in the uh, garage from 12 till 3. And... We do have several movies. We have the Dam Busters movie. We have a movie called Lancaster Skies. And this is um, where you can go in the library to um, explore our collection. Now, is that gonna go straight through or do I have to click? Click. It's after midnight on the 17th of May, 1943. It's a full moon. Wing Commander Guy Gibson cuts through the air in his Lancaster, headed straight over the Myrna Dam in Germany. He's got to be fast, low, and deadly accurate. Behind him, in his modified Avro Lancaster, already spinning is a new kind of drum-shaped weapon called a bouncing bomb. Gibson is leading Royal Air Force 617 Squadron in a mission codenamed Operation Chastise, though his team will become famous under a simpler name, the Dam Busters. Gibson is highly exposed in the run-up to the Myrna Dam. Flat guns are blazing to take him out of the sky as he readies his bomb. It's designed to bounce across the water and land at the base of the dam wall before detonating. With enough backspin on it, the drum should bounce perfectly and be pushed against the wall as the charge goes off. Sounds simple enough. However, Operation Chastise is anything but simple. Gibson knows he must drop the bomb at a height of exactly 60 feet if it is to bounce across the water, avoiding the underwater nets designed to stop enemy torpedoes and not bounce up into the plane. Flying this low over water meant that the standard altimeter was useless. Spotlights attached to the underside of the plane are angled so the reflection converges at precisely 60 feet. Luckily, the water over the dam is still and its glassy surface is just what the crew need. Using an impromptu sight that aligned with the towers on the dam made sure that the correct distance to drop. Anti-aircraft fire and flak is buzzing all around them and the gunner fires back with tracer rounds to try and intimidate the German gunners. Slowly, slowly the towers line up with the sight. Time to ditch that drum. Gibson releases the bomb. It hits the lake and after three bounces collides with the dam and sinks below the waterline. Depth fuses ignite the device and an epic torrent of water shoots skyward as it explodes. Thanks very much. I uh, hope you enjoyed uh, our presentation today and come back on February 12th and uh, we'll meet again. So take care, be healthy, be safe.